Welcome everyone, greetings, good evening. We're so excited to be here with you tonight. My name is Maurice Mitchell. I'm the National Director of the Working Families Party, a national political movement for the many, not the few. Now, we have an absolutely incredible lineup of speakers tonight. Now, we want people to know that we're out here. So please do go on social media and let folks know how you're spending your Tuesday evening. We're using hashtag time to deliver. And you can follow the Twitter feed of any of the sponsoring groups for content to retweet. Now, like I said, we have an incredible lineup of champions here tonight, each of whom is going to lay out the path to victory across the critical issues we are all working to get over the finish line. Care, housing, healthcare, climate, immigration, and tax fairness. Movements and people's organizations put it all on the line in 2020 to create the conditions for real progress on each of these fronts, especially movements and organizations dedicated to building the power of working class, black and brown folks across the country. And now real victories for our people are within reach. Now, I wanna say just one thing before I introduce Representative Jayapal, who has proven herself more than equal to the immense task that she volunteered to take on. And that is that these victories are within reach because of all of us. The movement came together and linked arms because we understood the enormity of the moment. Now, what do I mean by that? I mean that those of us building power on the ground in cities and states across the country and our allies and champions in Congress have been in deep strategic alignment since the beginning of this fight. And we have stayed that way at every turn. At each stage, we've been able to identify a division of labor that plays to our strengths. And we've been able to create the conditions for what I think most of us probably agree was one of the most impressive exercises of progressive political power in our lifetimes, the week just before last. Progressives in Congress under the leadership of Representative Jayapal and the Congressional Progressive Caucus stood together as a block to demand that Congress pass the entire Build Back Better agenda and made clear they were prepared to vote no on one piece of it that's and uh, vote no on one piece of it that's what it took to get the whole thing across the finish line. Uh, they stared down this sensationalist media coverage and threats from conservative Democrats and they carried the day. The fight is not just one just yet, but we are so much closer to winning it thanks to the Congressional Progressive Caucus. Now with that, I want to introduce our first guest of the evening, Representative Pramila Jayapal. She hails from Washington's 7th Congressional District, which she has represented since 2017. Since entering Congress, Representative Jayapal has been a relentless champion for working people, so much so that her colleagues elected her co-chair of the Congressional Progressive Caucus in just her second term. Under her leadership, the caucus has reorganize itself to become a force to be reckoned with and the partner in forging and executing an inside outside strategy that so many of us have been looking for. Representative Jayapal, thank you for your leadership and welcome. Maurice, thank you so much for that introduction. And you are exactly right. This is exactly the demonstration of powerful and strategic inside outside movement organizing. And I am so grateful to all of the organizations, Working Families Party, SEIU, Sierra Club, United We Dream, all of our organizational co-sponsors, especially the team at Indivisible for putting this all together. It's not only this event that you've made possible, it's really because of all of you, every organization, every activist, every volunteer, that the progressive movement has had one of its most important legislative wins of recent years. We're not over the finish line, as Maurice said, but we put the agenda for the entire Build Back Better uh, Act back on the table. Progressives in Congress have been clear about our priorities for this legislation since April. Priorities that reflect the core of the president's agenda and the democratic agenda. That is the care economy, climate action, housing, lowering prescription drug costs and expanding Medicare, and a roadmap to citizenship for immigrants. After it became clear that the president's economic plan was going to be split into two bills, our colleagues in the Senate, led by Senator Sanders, worked with the president 
to craft a funding package that would allow us to deliver these long overdue investments, especially landing on the Build Back Better Act as it stands today. And I wanna just take a moment here to thank particularly our 11 Senate colleagues who have been with us every step of the way, two of whom are with us tonight. Uh, that is Senator Sanders, of course, and Senator Markey, but also Senators Warren, Padilla, Booker, Gill Gillibrand, Hirono, Merkley, Schatz, Smith, and White House. We are grateful to all of you for just continuing to build this progressive movement uh, for, to deliver for the people. So House progressives put forward a proposal when the two bills were split apart that the two pieces of the legislation would move in tandem and that we would deliver the president's entire agenda to his desk together. But then a tiny group of conservative Democrats attempted to decouple the bills and move forward in the House with only the narrow infrastructure bill, which would have left Build Back Better and working people behind. But the House Progressive Caucus, and we're 96 members strong, held the line. And I am so proud of our caucus and of our movement. Our 96 member caucus stuck together as a block and insisted that Congress pass President Biden's entire agenda investing not only in roads and bridges, but also in working people, in families, in our communities. And it's worth repeating that had we allowed the infrastructure bill to move forward without the Build Back Better Act, which by the way is 85% of President Biden's agenda, then Congress would have voted to leave behind long overdue funding for childcare, for paid leave, for healthcare, for taking real action on climate, preschool, community college, affordable housing, home care, and a roadmap to citizenship for DREAMers, TPS recipients, and essential workers. Let me just tell you, we were not willing to do that. Progressives in the House held the line to keep our commitment, to deliver for women and families who desperately need childcare, paid leave, health care, and good paying jobs in the care economy. It was for young people who need us to take real action on the climate crisis. It was to provide free community college for young people who need that training and skills for a better future. And for millions of unhoused people who desperately need places to live, more affordable housing. It was for seniors who need us to bring down the price of life-saving pharmaceutical drugs and need us to finally provide them with hearing aids, glasses, and dentures. And it was for immigrants who have kept this country going during the pandemic. I've never been prouder of our caucus, our Senate allies, and our progressive movement than I am at this moment. We've been building towards this for moments, uh, this moment for years, if not for decades. Immigrants who have been relentless in insisting that elected officials recognize the dignity and humanity of our families and communities, even under constant threat of deportation. Young people who faced a future on an increasingly unlivable planet, who stood up and said, enough, the people with disabilities who demanded, you will hear us, you will see us, and you will not push us into institutions so that you can forget about us. Every single woman who said, I refuse to accept that the essential work of caregiving is underpaid and underappreciated any longer. And every single person who worked to ensure that there would be progressives in Congress for this fight at this time. Now, a lot of people have asked, isn't something better than nothing? And the answer quite simply is no, because when it comes down to something rather than nothing, it's the same people who are forced to settle for nothing over and over and over again. It's the reason why we have a housing crisis in this country with public housing having fallen into such decay that it's threatening the health of people who live there. It's how we got to a code red for humanity on climate and our government is still subsidizing fossil fuel companies. And it's why it took a global pandemic and over 700,000 American deaths to force those in power to confront the longstanding, deeply rooted inequalities in this country. We're not gonna ask people to get by with nothing while millionaires and billionaires continue to get richer without paying anywhere near their fair share in, Congress, in taxes. We progressives in Congress held the line but we're not done yet. And let me be clear that this is not just some crazy progressive wish list that nobody else agrees with. 
This is President Joe Biden's agenda. This is the agenda that Democrats in the House, the Senate, and the White House were elected on. And this is the agenda that over 70% of the American people want to see done. So over the next few weeks, Congress and the White House are negotiating over what the final package looks like. We succeeded in putting the president's full agenda back on track, but now we actually have to deliver on that agenda so that people wake up and they feel, like in their hearts, they feel the transformational change in their daily lives. In both the Senate and the House, we are united in our insistence that these priorities, climate action, the care economy, housing, roadmap to citizenship, expanded healthcare, and tax fairness are included and funded in the final bill. We have to insist that the will of the 96% of Democrats in the House and the Senate, the leadership of the president and the majority of the American people is not ignored for the misplaced priorities of 4% of our colleagues who aren't yet on board. We have no intention of backing down. And if we all continue to stick together in the Senate, the House, in Congress, in the movement, as we have so far, I just know that we can deliver the most significant economic transformational investment in working people, in poor people, in families, in black, brown, indigenous communities, in women, in nearly a century. And now I'd like to kick us off by discussing one of the pillars of the Build Back Better agenda and one that is particularly close to my heart, and that is immigration. I come to you today as the first Indian American Congresswoman elected to the House of Representatives and one of only 14 naturalized citizens in Congress. I was just 16 years old when I came to the United States by myself to attend college. My parents sacrificed so much using all of their savings a mere $5,000 at the time to send me here because they believed that this is where I would get the best education and have the brightest future. And they made that sacrifice despite the fact that they were sending me alone to this country, knowing that I might never live on the same continent as them. And in fact, that's what's happened. It took me 17 years and an alphabet soup of visas to get my citizenship. And I come to this work in Congress, like so many of you, for 20 years as an activist and an organizer, founding what would become the largest immigrant rights organization in Washington state, one of the largest in the country. And I bring my story and the stories of our immigrant communities with me wherever I go. Taking our stories with me from being that 16 year old girl with nothing in my pocket by myself in a strange new country to sitting across from the president of the United States in the Oval Office and telling him why we have to do this, why we have to make sure that immigrants across our country, indeed across our world, can continue to look at America and know that the American dream is possible. Because while it was possible for me, it's not really possible for people across this country. And that's not acceptable. And so that's what I shared with the president a few weeks ago. I shared your stories, immigrant stories with him. And I told him, that we needed to make sure that the American dream is real for people across this country. We have to protect our essential workers, immigrant workers who are putting their lives at risk and that of their families every single day to keep all of us safe. We have to do right by farm workers who have been working through devastating heat and a global pandemic to keep food on our tables. We have to finally keep our promises to dreamers and TPS holders. And we have to stop deporting immigrants who have been holding up this country for decades. And let's not forget that our lives in America are deeply linked to the state of the world. Not just as we saw with COVID, knowing no geographical bounds, but also as we look forward to the fact that 216 million people could be forced from their homes across the world due to climate change by 2050. So my sisters, brothers, and siblings, this is our moment to deliver transformational change across movements with solidarity, with joy, with love, and with commitment to all of us. We have come together, immigrant, labor, and progressive movements to successfully pass the Dream and Promise Act out of the House twice. We united to put Joe Biden in the White House and to deliver states like Arizona, 
back to Democrats with young immigrant voters coming out to vote. We stayed with Democrats in charge of Congress with a mandate to meet this moment. The Build Back Better Act is the embodiment of that mandate. And we just have to get it done. We are more powerful together. And Maurice, I know we can make the impossible possible when we fight together for citizenship for our communities, for action on climate, for healthcare and education, and so much more. We make the road by walking. And this is a hell of a journey for all of us towards a just and equitable society for all of us. Maurice, back to you. Thank you so much, Representative Jayapal. And I think I speak for everybody who's watching to say that we are proud to be in this fight with you. I now have the real honor of introducing my friend and comrade, Grace Martinez Rosas, Executive Director of United We Dream and United We Dream Action. Anyone who has stood beside her and many who don't know that Grace is an unstoppable force in the struggle for immigrant rights and immigrant justice. Thanks to the bravery of immigrant youth, real immigration reform is actually in the cards and is going to be on all of us to make sure that we deliver. Grace, welcome. Tell us how we could get across the finish line. What's up, Mo? What's up hey. to everybody? So good to be on. So good to see you. Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Grace Martinez Rosas. I'm a Mexican woman wearing glasses and a blue dress. I am undocumented, unafraid, queer, and unashamed. And I have the honor to serve as the executive director of United We Dream and United We Dream Action. We are the nation's largest network of undocumented immigrant youth. And first, I want to give a shout out to the Indivisible team and the Progressive Caucus and all of you watching this live stream today who understand that now is the hashtag time to deliver. So if you're on Twitter, which I know that you are doing right now, please make sure to follow the hashtag and amplify this conversation. So as we continue to face a compounded crisis of COVID-19 pandemic, the attacks on our democracy and a growing uh, white supremacy, we all know that now is the time to deliver, no excuses. We know that this election was won by the folks most negatively impacted by the Trump administration, by black people, by poor people. We know that those that more Democrats need to borrow some of this grassroots courage that ensured that uh, women in Georgia delivered and showed up, that organizers in Arizona ensured that they were knocking on doors. This is the moment, this is the day that immigrants, that janitors, that women uh, have built and created for this moment. So undocumented people like me, we know that we live intersectional lives. We have championed the five progressive priorities to make sure that we are strengthening the care economy, making bold investments in affordable housing, dramatically lowering drug prices, making a bold investments to address the climate crisis that we face and providing a pathway to citizenship for millions of undocumented immigrants like myself. You know, undocumented people have, have been part and always been part of those who have kept us fed, safe and healthy throughout this pandemic and the decades before. We are domestic workers, we are nurses, we are janitors, we are farm workers that are continuing to work during the massive wildfires to harvest our crops. And let us be clear and let us be real. 70% of all likely voters in 2020, and check this out, it's Democrats, Independents, and Republicans know that now is the time to deliver and support a pathway to citizenship for undocumented people just like me. So as we see the horrific images of Black, Haitian, and Central American migrants uh, being whipped by horseback, it is a reminder that we must deliver protections and leave or leave millions of people vulnerable to detention, deportation, and family separation. Sisters, brothers, siblings, I was there in the mass mobilizations that we saw in the last four years. I felt you and I saw you when we, we, we declared without any hesitation that immigrants are welcomed here. And now let us be ready to deliver the same fervor, courage, and power to protect immigrants at this moment. Organizers and directly impacted people just like me and the members of United We Dream, we've been working hard all year, all year to create the conditions to win. We have shared our stories, made calls, built campaigns like the We Are Home campaign with many of our partners on this call. We've put our bodies on the line to demonstrate the urgency of this moment for millions of undocumented people. Democrats have a once in a generation opportunity this year to finally break through a stalemate of 35 years and provide relief for undocumented people. 
There is no recovery and no relief without immigrants. But sisters, brothers, and siblings, the beauty of this moment is that we get to determine what this country will be, that we have an opportunity to deliver for immigrants and for the people that elected us and that put their trust on our movement. We have the opportunity to deliver. And so uh, we have come too far we will not turn around and we will ensure that these streets are flooded with justice, with voters, with people on the streets to ensure that we deliver what a multiracial, black women led democracy and people, young people of color have de delivered without any hesitation. Now is the time, si se puede, let's go, let's do this. Let's go, si se puede. Thank you so much, Grace. Uh, next up, we are thrilled to be joined by the one and only Senator Bernie Sanders. And let me just say that while the entire world knows Senator Sanders as a tireless champion of the working class, what Senator Sanders has done in the U.S. Senate over the past few months has been simply extraordinary. Now, as the chair of the Senate Budget Committee, Senator Sanders has, has, has shepherded through a legislative program that, when passed, will transform the lives of tens of millions of working class people across this country. And he has been a strategic partner both to the movements and people's organizations and to House progressives, as both have worked to navigate Democrats' narrow majorities on the path to victory. Senator Sanders, thank you for all of your efforts. The floor is yours. Reese, thank you very much. And let me not only thank you, but thank the progressive movement throughout this country for electing great progressives to the Congress, more progressives there than we've ever had in recent history, and for mobilizing the American people to justice. So thank you very much for what you are doing, for what Greaser is doing. And let me also thank Pramila uh, Jayapal. Uh, she has played an extraordinary role in uh, leading the progressive caucus uh, in a way that I would never have imagined. Uh, brothers and sisters, this is a pivotal and unprecedented moment in American history. That's the simple truth. Uh, I think all of you know that for the last many decades, the people on top, the very wealthiest people in this country have become much richer. We now have the totally absurd situation of two people, two billionaires, owning more wealth than the bottom 40%, top 1%, owning more wealth than the bottom 92%. You got the 1% owning more wealth than the entire middle class. So in America, you got tens of millions of people whose problems have long been neglected by Congress and by presidents while the very rich get richer. And what we are finally saying is we're not gonna ignore those problems anymore. That now is the time for us to stand up for the working class of this country and tell the billionaires that they're gonna to have to start paying their fair share of taxes. What we are talking about is not simply a laundry list, a wish list. It is the needs of the American people. We will no longer continue to have the highest rate of childhood poverty of almost any major country on earth. And that's why with the American Rescue Plan, and those $300 direct payments. We have cut childhood poverty in America in half, and we ain't going back. We want to further reduce childhood poverty in this country. And if we don't pass the Build Back America plan, poverty for kids will go up. We have a dysfunctional child care system where working families are paying 20, 30% of their limited incomes for child care. Workers are paid starvation wages, and millions of women are unable to go to work because they can't afford childcare. That is absurd. We are going to make sure that no family in America pays more than 7% of their incomes for childcare. We're going to make pre K universal and free. We're going to deal with the affordable housing crisis. We are tired of seeing half a million people in this country homeless, sleeping out on the streets. We're tired of 18 million households paying 50% or more of their limited incomes for housing. We're going to deal with climate because we know we have the moral responsibility to address that so that the planet we leave for our kids and grandchildren is healthy and habitable. Yeah, we, are, we do have the guts to take on the fossil fuel industry and transform 
our energy system away from fossil fuel to energy efficiency and sustainable energy. And we're gonna deal with the home healthcare crisis. Two issues that I wanna spend a minute on deal with healthcare. Pramila and I, and I know all of you understand that it is totally unacceptable that we are the only major country on earth not to guarantee healthcare to every man, woman, and child as a human right. And the result of that is we've got 90 million people today who are uninsured or underinsured. We got tens of thousands of people who die each and every year because they can't get to a doctor on time or get the prescription drugs that they need. This cannot and must not be allowed to happen in the wealthiest country on earth. So we are fighting for a Medicare for all single payer program, but we don't have the support in the Congress right now to do that. That support among the American people is growing, but we're not there. But at the very least, what we are gonna do in terms of healthcare, two major things. Number one, we're gonna finally take on the greed and thievery of the pharmaceutical industry who charge us the highest prices in the world for prescription drugs. Some of you may recall that a couple of years ago, I took a trip with folks from the Midwest into Canada. And I went there not to do sightseeing, but we went there to buy prescription drugs and we purchased insulin made, manufactured by the same exact company, sold in the United States for 10 times more than we paid in Canada, 10 times more. Meanwhile, last year, the six major drug companies made $50 billion in profit. Their CEOs receive huge, exorbitant compensation packages. And yet one out of four Americans cannot afford the medicine their doctors prescribe. So we are gonna take on the pharmaceutical industry and their greed and their dishonesty and the hundreds of millions of dollars. It's true hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars they are spending to defeat the Build Back America plan and our determination to lower the cost of prescription drugs. And the other thing that we are gonna do in terms of healthcare, terribly important to the American people, is to expand Medicare to cover dental care, hearing aids, and eyeglasses. You know, in this country, we should not have many, many millions of seniors who have no teeth in their mouths or become sick because they cannot adequately digest their food. That is not acceptable. We cannot continue to have God knows how many seniors who are unable to communicate and listen to their grandchildren or their friends because they can't afford the outrageous cost of hearing aids and people cannot read newspapers because they can't afford eyeglasses. And that is why as we continue the fight for a Medicare for all single payer system, at least now, at least now, we have got to guarantee that Medicare cover dental care, eyeglasses, and hearing aids. So here we are at a moment when the ruling class of this country, the big money interests, I'm talking about the drug companies, I'm talking about the insurance companies, I'm talking about the fossil fuel industry, we're talking about the billionaires who don't want to pay their fair share of taxes, they are spending ungodly amounts of money to try to defeat what we are doing. But the truth of the matter is, as you have heard from Pramila and Maurice and others, the overwhelming majority of the American people are on our side. They are sick and tired of Washington catering to the needs of the rich and the powerful and campaign contributors. They want us to stand up for them. So that is where we are right now. We are in a moment where if we stand strong, we can bring forth transformative change to improve the lives of working families, black and white and Latino, Native American, Asian American. We can restore the faith of the American people that their government can work for them and not just the well-connected. So I wanna thank uh, all of you uh, at the grassroots level for all that you are doing and we've gotta continue the fight. We can win this thing, transform America and restore faith in democracy.
So Maurice, thank you very much. Thank you, and we hear you loud and clear. Let's stand strong. This is a critical moment, and thank you so much, Senator Sanders, for everything that you've done to get us here. Next, I'm thrilled to bring up two people who are absolutely indispensable to the fight to preserve a habitable planet and to make sure that justice and equity are at the heart of everything we do to save it. Ramon Cruz is the president of the Sierra Club, which under his leadership has thrown everything it has at seizing this moment to deliver for our people and the planet. And Senator Ed Markey of Massachusetts, who is the stalwart original sponsor of the Green New Deal resolution of the Thrive Act and just about every key climate bill the Congress has seen. Ramon, Senator Markey, welcome. Thank you. Thanks so much, Maurice. Uh, it's, you know, what an honor to be uh, among all of you and all these uh, great panelists. I'm, I'm humbled and I'm honored to be here as president of the Sierra Club, uh, which is the nation's oldest and largest grassroots environmental organization with nearly 4 million members and supporters. And we're proud to stand shoulder to shoulder to, with, with all these congressional champions and union and health, racial justice, immigrant rights and other allies that you know, that are saying loud and clear that we just have no time to waste. You know, we have no time to waste as our communities face intensifying storms, fires, droughts, heat waves, floods. No, we have no time to waste as our children inhale diesel fumes and drink lead contaminated water. And, and we have no time to waste as President Biden heads to Glasgow in less than three weeks for the Global Climate Summit, where the world will be watching to see if the U.S. will lead again, we, you know, if, if to see if the U.S. will cooperate with other nations and deliver on its international climate commitments. That's why it is urgent and essential that we pass a Build Back Better Act that passes what we call the climate test. You know, and passing the climate test means achieving President Biden's goal of cutting climate pollution in half by 2030 while creating good union jobs and a more equitable economy. Concretely, that means fully funding clean energy tax credits and a clean electricity performance program, two of the drivers of significant emissions reductions. And, and meeting the, the climate test also requires expanding access to union-built electric vehicles and clean public transit. It means retrofitting our homes and schools to cut pollution while building healthier living and learning environments. And it means creating a civilian climate core to create good jobs while protecting our public lands. And it means eliminating all fossil fuel subsidies. No more handouts to corporate polluters. At the same time, we need bold investments in environmental justice to redress the devastating health and economic impact of toxic pollution, primarily in black, brown and indigenous communities. That includes replacing lead pipes across the country, investing directly in communities impacted by environmental injustice and cleaning up Superfund and other polluted sites. So fortunately, Democrats in both House and Senate have recognized the urgency of our moment and have stood firm in saying no climate, no deal. So our message to members of Congress is simple, you know, to the Congressional Progressive Caucus and Senate champions, to frontline members of, in both houses of Congress, to Speaker Pelosi, Majority Leader Schumer, and to 99% of House and Senate Democrats. We say, you know, thank you for holding the line for transformational climate action. And, and to President Biden, we, thank, we say thank you for putting forward an agenda that truly build back better. And we're looking, uh, you know, to you to get this historic le legislation across the finish line. So we're looking to you to walk into the global climate talks in less than three weeks with historic climate investments in your briefcase. So for a more livable, you know, climate, for a more just economy, for a health of our communities, we thank you. And now I'll pass it on to that great senator from Massachusetts, that great climate champion, um, you know, and for a champion for climate jobs, for, for green jobs, Senator Markey. Oh, great. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks to the Sierra Club. Thanks to all the environmentalists. Thanks to everyone who is on this call tonight for everything that you are doing to uh, fight for historic climate action. Um, thanks to all my congressional partners who 
are, are joining here this evening because right now the fate of climate action is in our hands. And I cannot overstate this enough. This is the moment to pass the most consequential climate and economic legislation in generations. The two pieces of legislation, the bipartisan infrastructure bill and the budget reconciliation package would make historic investments in our country's physical and human infrastructure. They are Joe Biden's Build Back Better agenda. And we cannot build back better unless we build back greener. Our workers and families need both of these bills to pass together. That is the deal. And that is the best deal for our country. Uh, and that's why we're so proud of Pramila and all of the progressive Democrats in the House for holding the line, uh, because there's been a lot of talk recently about what progressive lawmakers need to be willing to cut, what we have to be willing to negotiate on. Well, we cannot negotiate with deadly wildfires. They don't negotiate. We cannot negotiate with massive hurricanes. They don't negotiate. We cannot negotiate with floodwaters, sea level rise, droughts, temperature rise, and we cannot negotiate how much these climate fuel disasters are costing us. Tens of billions in the past few years alone. Let's just look at the disaster that we had just in the last month. It's billions of dollars. And to those who say climate action is too expensive, look around. As climate inaction uh, is costing us billions. Billionaires in our country have grown their wealth by $1.8 trillion over the cost of this pandemic. And that is enough to pay for half of the entire $3.5 trillion package, just the wealth that has gone to billionaires in our country. And as billionaires complain about entitlement societies, they meanwhile have become 62% richer during this pandemic. If we're gonna talk about entitlements, let's talk about the real entitlements in our economy, in our tax code. The real entitlements are the tens of billions of dollars in tax breaks that the oil companies, the gas companies, the coal companies receive every single year, even as they earn the greatest profits in the history of the world. The real entitlements are the corporate tax loopholes and the offshore tax breaks that shield companies from paying their fair share for participating in the American economy. The real entitlements are the special tax breaks that Wall Street executives receive that allow them to pay lower tax rates than most middle class workers. So as we move forward with these negotiations on our spending, we need to remember what the real entitlements are in this country. It's time for us to stop talking about what is politically feasible and start talking about what is scientifically necessary. We cannot compromise on science. Policies will either take steps to save the planet or they will not. And we should not compromise on the millions of good paying union jobs in solar and wind and electric vehicles once we pass the budget reconciliation package, including the tens of thousands of jobs in the Civilian Climate Corps, jobs and investments that will be in the whole field of environmental justice, long overlooked, making sure that vulnerable communities that are born the worst burdens of our addiction to fossil fuels, that must be corrected. That has to be in this bill. Emissions reductions, jobs and justice, those are the non-negotiables. Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and I introduced the Green New Deal just two and a half years ago, and it's created a movement across this country. Deb Harlan and I, just two years ago this week, we introduced the Thrive Act to create an even broader frame for how to look at these issues. So we've come a long way, and we've got to finish it off in this debate. When Congress was debating infrastructure earlier this year, I said no climate, no deal. The budget reconciliation package is the climate part of that deal. We need to pass both bills together, finally take steps towards addressing the most important issue 
facing our world, the climate crisis. It is the economic, environmental, national security, and moral issue of our time. And we can do it by making the ultra wealthy, the big corporations and the polluting fossil fuel industry pay for it. So I'm very grateful that the House progressives are continuing uh, to uphold uh, their end. I know that uh, Jimmy Gomez and Barbara Lee and my great partner from Massachusetts, Ayanna Presley, uh, are on tonight. Uh, and Bernie, you've already heard from him. So you know that we've got a, a battle on and we're in this fight. And the Sierra Club out there just being this beacon of truth in terms of what we have to do. So we're partnered. If you guys keep your energy level high, you keep contacting your members of the House and Senate. Let them know that this is important. Congress is a stimulus response institution. There's nothing more stimulating than tens of thousands of people calling in, texting in, tweeting, doing whatever is necessary in order to get a political result. Then we will win. So thank you all so much for all that you are doing. And, and thank you. And we're all with you in the concept that the science and the politics dictate that we act now without compromise. Now, I told you all that this was going to be an incredible lineup. And I think you could see that 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 is coming to bear. And I am thrilled to invite my sister, Representative Ayanna Presley, onto the stage. Representative Presley has represented the seventh district in Massachusetts since 2019. She has quickly emerged as one of the most forceful advocates for ending mass incarceration and transforming our collective approach to public safety, as well as canceling student debt. As a member of the House Financial Services Committee, she has been fighting doggedly for the full scope of housing investments in Build Back Better. Representative Presley makes us so very proud every day, and we are so grateful and glad that you are joining us here tonight. Uh, you make me so proud. Thank you so much for that introduction, Maurice. And good evening, family. Um, you know, my following uh, Senator Markey, I know what you're all thinking. You're thinking Ayanna Presley is so fortunate that she has Senator Markey and Senator Warren as her two senators. Uh, and you are right. Uh, we are so very fortunate here in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. And I thank them uh, for their leadership and their partnership. And um, it's just so good to be with all of you uh, in virtual community with my movement siblings this evening. Uh, it is my honor to be more than an ally, but to be a co-conspirator and an accomplice in this fight and this work with you. What do we want? Justice. When do we want it? Now. We know that in this moment, the stakes have never been higher. The pandemic has made all too clear the consequences of decades of disinvestment and generations of what I would characterize as policy violence, targeting our communities, creating hurt and harm. If we are truly going to build back better, we can't afford to tinker around the edges. We must be bold in this moment. We must be unapologetic in this moment. We must take advantage of this once in a lifetime, once in a generation opportunity and responsibility to finally invest in the workers, in the families and in the communities that for far too long have been asked to wait. We held the line because we wanted to leave no one behind. We reject the false binary choices that force us to choose between the livelihood of the union worker building our roads and the livelihood of the childcare worker caring for our babies so that union worker can build that road. These are unjust, false binary choices. We should not be forced to choose between investing in our crumbling housing stock and our crumbling bridges. And the good news is, thanks to the strength of this movement, of the most marginalized, which mobilized Black, Brown, AAPI, Indigenous, LGBTQ, young and disabled. And speaking of leaving no one behind, let me pause for a moment to thank our interpreters this evening. And I also just want to uh, acknowledge that I'm a black woman with a smooth brown bald head, <laughs> wearing pink lipstick and a fitted black sweater. Okay, but the good news is the Democrats, thanks to that movement of the most marginalized, which mobilized, the Democrats control the House, the Senate and the White House. We are in power. 
We are in the majority. We have a mandate and we have to act like it. As my dear uh, sibling in the movement, Brittany Packnett Cunningham reminds us, scared power is in power at all. We are in power. We are in the majority. And that must mean more than a talking point. So we can and we must do both. We must meet, move with urgency to meet this moment. We have a mandate and a responsibility to combat the affordable housing crisis, to enact paid leave, universal child care, environmental justice, a pathway to citizenship, and so much more. Now, as a member on the House Financial Services Committee, under the steadfast leadership of Chairwoman Maxine Waters, I was proud to help advance some 300 billion, that's with a B, in truly historic housing investments as a part of the Build Back Better Act. Proposals that will finally begin to invest in our housing stock as the critical infrastructure that it is and invest billions to create and update affordable, equitable, safe, and accessible housing. Billions to address racial home ownership gaps and to finally help Black and Brown families to build generational wealth. When we talk about this reckoning on racial injustice, the only receipts that matter are budgets and policies. It's investments like this that will make the difference. Billions to make our housing stock more climate resilient, to remove lead, mold, and other hazards from our public housing. Housing is a fundamental human right, period. And in this moment, we have an opportunity to legislate as such. Now, let me be clear, and Senator Sanders spoke to this, and as did Congresswoman Jaya Paula. Let me just say, is it any coincidence at such a time as this, at such an inflection point of this, that we have a woman of color leading the Congressional Progressive Caucus, and this is the biggest Congressional Progressive Caucus in the history of Congress, and thanks to her leadership and the support of all of you which has emboldened us, that means something. But let me be clear. There is no deficit of resources. No, there's no deficit of resource. There is only a deficit of empathy. And that is why this movement is so critical. We need to make plain the people, the people behind the priorities, the lives impacted by inaction and the lives that stand to be impacted by necessary, long overdue policy change and budgetary investments. Now this bill is paid for as long as Washington has the political courage to make corporations and the ultra rich finally pay their fair share. So we must continue to fight to ensure that all of these critical investments are included in the final package because we can't compromise when it comes to impact. We have to keep our word and deliver on our promises. So let's continue to make the case. Together, we will get this done. This is an unprecedented moment that demands of us unprecedented movement building, unprecedented organizing, and unprecedented legislating. And we'll get it done with unprecedented unity. So let's keep holding the line and leave no one behind. Thanks, family. Thank you. You heard it. You heard it from Representative Presley. Let's keep holding the line. Right. When we're united, we could do anything. And I'd like to now bring up two more exceptional leaders, Mary Kay Henry, president of the Service Employees International Union and Representative Barbara Lee of the 13th District in California. Now, over the past few years, I've had the real privilege of working closely with Mary Kay, and she has an extraordinary ability to tenaciously fight for the best interests of SEIU is nearly 2 million members and move in deep alignment with the immigration movement, the climate movement, and everyone else who's fighting for working people, whether they're represented by a union or not. Representative Lee is, of course, a lion, a stalwart, one of the most consistent and forceful advocates for a better world that we have in Congress, even in times when that was a much more lonelier thing to be. Mary Kay and Representative Lee are going to talk about the way forward on our care priorities. Mary Kay, over to you. It's time, Maurice. It's time to deliver. I'm so proud to stand in solidarity with each and every uh, congressional leader on this call, with the hundreds that are watching us online that I know are Twittering and tweeting and 
generating action on hashtag it's time to deliver. And it's certainly an honor to be with our sister, uh, Representative Barbara Lee, to discuss with everyone the incredible urgency that we feel about a game-changing investment in home care that will add 1 million jobs for Black, Brown, Asian Pacific Islander, Indigenous, white, and immigrant women who make up the majority of the care workforce in this country. And it will expand access to care for up to 3 million seniors and people with disabilities who need the care. We know that in millions of households from coast to coast, home care workers are providing quality care in the midst of a pandemic where they had to drive from dollar store to dollar store to scrape together their personal protective equipment and make sure that seniors and people with disabilities were allowed to live at home with dignity and independence. And they also have made it possible for family members who have been unpaid and had to drop out of the workforce to be able to rejoin the paid workforce. And the fact is that 10,000 Americans are turning 65 years old every day and millions more households are gonna need this critical home and community-based care over the next decade. We are united behind the full Build Back Better agenda. We stand in alignment with every movement represented in this gathering tonight because our members' lives are at that intersection of climate and immigration and housing and care uh, investments and healthcare uh, needs. And we are crystal clear that home care workers and consumers know that with a $400 billion investment in care, we can do two things at once that we've never done before, which is improve the lives of seniors and people with disabilities and take caregiving out of poverty wage work and make it a living wage job that caregivers can actually support themselves and their families on for the first time since the country was founded. We think an investment in home care is gonna make it possible to create living wage work in the fastest growing job in the economy and provide a pathway to a better life for black, Latina, Asian, indigenous, white and immigrant women who are the power of the home care services in this country. Women like Joan Steed, she's a home care worker from Phoenix, Arizona, and Joan's been a home care worker for three decades, like many of the women doing this work who care deeply about their mission. But while she loves caring for people, she's experienced the painful reality of not being able to take care of herself, given the low wages and inadequate benefits she receives from taking care of others. Despite working around the clock for 30 years, she has no retirement savings and will continue working past 65. She didn't get paid when she was providing at home, often back-breaking care to her family members for nearly 20 years. That's why she's mobilizing to fix this broken system she spoke out on the steps of Congress this morning, and in a few days, she's taking her message straight to Vice President Harris. What she and other home care workers and all of us here are asking for is quite simple. All home care workers should get paid a living wage for the work they do to be able to save and to properly care for themselves and their own families and have the right to join together in a union so they can bargain a better life through their collective action. As I've said, home care workers are primarily women. Women of color make up the majority of this workforce, and that has got to be addressed as part of the many priorities in Build Back Better. That includes the investments in people who need home and community care, good home care jobs, and the president's full care agenda with paid leave, child care, and pre-K, we must make sure that care investments that let everyone do the work in this nation are taking care of our families. 
Because of the courageous activism of Joan and other home care workers and the efforts of champions like everyone here to advance the full Build Back Better agenda, progress is on the horizon to achieve an economy where each and every one of us can thrive. We've already heard the crises we face are multiple and overlapping, and our solutions must reflect the scale of the crises that our families face in this country. That's why home care workers and the two million members of SEIU didn't stop fighting in November. We hit the streets, took our messages straight to elected leaders, and are now laser focused and united in our mission to pass the Build Back Better plan in its entirety with all of the priorities that we are talking about tonight. To everyone tuning in, we know you're fighting like hell. We got to keep fighting like hell to ensure that Congress passes the entire Build Back Better plan, including each and every progressive priority, strengthening our care economy, building a pathway to citizenship, investing in affordable housing, climate resilience, lowering drug prices, expanding our health care, and creating tax fairness. Tell your elected representatives why they must pass the entire Build Back Better plan. No cuts, no delays. Hashtag, it's time to deliver. We got to share stories like Jones and like Pramila's who kicked us off with her own story to make it morally and politically impossible to deny these critical investments and leave people like her in the balance. Let's keep fighting because we know we can't wait any longer for an economy and a democracy that works for all of us, no exceptions. And now I'll turn it over to my sister, Representative Barbara Lee, and our members in Oakland always say, Barbara Lee, she speaks for me. Mary Kay, thank you so much <laughs> for that very spirited introduction. And thank you to Maurice. And thank you to Ramon. You know, Mary Kay and Ramon, it is so wonderful to have both of you together, Sierra Club and SEIU. It just manifests and, and highlights the intersectional nature of our struggle right now and how we, from all spaces, come together to say it is time to deliver for our people and we will not leave anybody behind. And so it's such an honor to be here with my colleagues, my sister, Ayanna Presley, who of course hit the ground running. I think she's been here at least 20 years now in Congress, given the phenomenal work she's done. And my brother, Congressman uh, Jimmy Gomez, who is quite a leader on so many issues, a progressive leader and from California, who has stood with working men and women all of his life. So good to see you. And of course, our chair, our brilliant, strong, uh, and very focused chair of the Congressional Black Caucus, excuse me, Progressive Caucus, Congresswoman Pramila Jaffa, who speaks for so many of our caucuses and who has, has held steady uh, and, and really kept us, uh, I won't say in line, but kept us focused and disciplined and, and keeping our eyes on the prize, as our dear beloved Congressman John Lewis would say. So thank you, Chairwoman uh, Jayapal, for really keeping us settled <laughs> and making sure that uh, we uh, know what we're doing as we move forward with these negotiations in terms of our priorities. It's really been phenomenal. And uh, we're going to get there. We're going to get there with all of our activists, with all of you out there really making it happen, because it is about you. It is about the people who are going to uh, carry this over the finish line. And let me just say to Senator Sanders and to Senator Markey how wonderful it is that they were here uh, or are here because we couldn't do this without them. This is a bicameral effort. Uh, we have to have our Senate and we know what's taking place in terms of the negotiations and they have stayed the course. And so it's, it's so important to have our progressive senators um, working with us each and every day. You know, uh, everyday families, essential workers, uh, caregivers, these are the people we cannot leave behind. You know, we all, we all know that our essential workers have been essential workers even before the pandemic, even before the pandemic. Some just realize how essential that they are and will continue to be once we do justice in this Build Back Better on their behalf. And also, uh, I just have to say, uh, in this bill, we have, and it's so important to remember, we have our racial disparities 
uh, provisions and repairing communities most harmed by our nation's legacy of systemic racism. And of course that impacts people of color the most, women, our LGBTQ community, our disabled community. And so the disparities and the gaps that have historically been here, now it is time to deliver on behalf of so many people who have been left behind. Let's talk about a couple of things very quickly. The facts as it relates to childcare. Now, uh, and this is specifically as it relates to African-American families, but we know that people of color uh, are really the, the most impacted by the lack of access to quality childcare services, services, but also the resources to and the investments that they need, the money to pay for childcare. A typical median income black family with two young children would have to spend 56% of income on childcare, which is a share of total, total family income that's much larger than any other group. Subsidizing childcare would help so many families, so many black families, so many API Latinos, so many native families, so many LGBTQ families make ends meet and ensure quality childcare. My own personal story, yeah, in the day I raised two little boys as a single mom on public assistance. I had to take them to class with me at Mills College. Those of you from Oakland, you know Mills College, right? They sat through class and I remember I got a C plus in statistics and I wanted a B or an A and I took that class twice and my kids sat through st staff twice with me because I could not afford childcare. They know statistics better than I. But then in the day, the, le the waiting lists were so long. It took three years to find affordable childcare. I couldn't afford it. And then once the childcare was available, you know, the hours were such that I couldn't go to school without picking them up, taking them to another childcare center. And so, you know, this shouldn't be in 2021. It should not be. And so mothers and fathers, people of color should be able to have the confidence that they have good quality childcare centers and the resources and the, it, and the investments in this bill to be able to help them with their childcare. They want to work. People who are unemployed, women especially, black and brown women, they want to work, our immigrant women, but they can't work because they can't afford childcare. It's as simple as that. Now let's talk about caregivers. And I have my own personal story. Mary Kay, you know that. Well, you know, I'm, I'm a volunteer caregiver, but if it weren't for caregivers in SEIU, my late mother lived in assisted living. She lived to be 90 years old. And it was because she had good, quality, loving caregivers. My aunt now will be 101 years old in November. She's alive today. I saw her yesterday, talked with her caregivers. She's alive because she has good quality health care and good quality caregivers. That's why she's alive. And so there's no way there is no way we're going to allow this bill to move forward without our care economy valued and respected and invested in. So 87% of home care workers are women, 62% are people of color, 31% are immigrants, 66% of black and Latino caregivers said that family caregiving responsibilities impacted their ability to work. And finally, workers of color are less likely to have access to any family and medical leave, paid or unpaid. They're more likely to forego time away from work simply because they can't afford to. And so the Build Back Better Act's national paid leave program would stop families from having to choose between their pay paycheck and caregiving. Uh, we need to follow up on our investments in Medicaid, home and community-based services. Not only does it provide for quality health services for our health elderly, but it improves wages and supports our home care workers who are undervalued in many respects, and we know that, and underpaid. And so again, we all have firsthand stories to tell, but make no mistake, the Build Back Better agenda has got to include our caregiving individuals, economy, our labor union workers, and our family members. It has a, it's an economic agenda. Remember that and I always remind people that 
This is not a social service agenda. This is an economic agenda. It's an agenda to fight poverty. It's an investment in our care economy to pay living wages, good paid union living wages. And so this is essential. It is not optional. And so we know that the Progressive Caucus knows that. I have to thank our chair once again, because we know that now is the time, now is the time to deliver and we're going to deliver. We know the battles we have to fight, but we're up for it because of you. This is how legislation works. Remember now, we had four years of autocratic dictatorial rule. The public has not seen how Congress is supposed to work, how democracy is supposed to work. Well, we're showing by our negotiations and by setting our priorities very clear on who we're fighting for, that this is what it's supposed to be about. And so just know the Biden agenda is our agenda. You all are our agenda and you have helped us get this far. And we're going to take this over the finish line because of you. So thank you again. It is time to deliver. That's right. It's time to deliver. And now is the time. Thank you so much, Representative Lee, for lifting up your personal story and Mary Kay for lifting up the story of your members. Now, one thing I'm sure everyone here knows is that our tax system contains more giveaways to the rich than any of us can count. Next, I want to introduce Representative Jimmy Gomez from the 34th Congressional District in California. Representative Gomez sits on the Critical Ways and Means Committee, which has responsibility for raising practically all of the new revenue measures that will be part of Build Back Better. Along with other CPC members on the committee, he has been pushing to raise the money that will pay for all of the Build Back Better investments and make a dent in the obscene inequality that has come to define this country. Representative Gomez, welcome to the call. Maurice, thank you so much. And I want to just say uh, hello to my, my sisters and brothers in arms uh, who have been holding the line uh, on the progressive Build Back Better agenda. That's, uh, of course, Congresswoman Pramila Jayapal, the, the state's person, Barbara Lee, because we all look up to Barbara Lee and her, her experience and her wisdom. And of course, my, my sister, Ayanna Presley, as well as the two senators, uh, Bernie Sanders and Ed Markey. It, we are a, a team. Um, we hold the line because that's where we get our power. Um, all of us come from uh, different parts of organizing. I was a labor uh, organizer with AFSCME International, as well as the United Nurses Association of California. So what you're seeing is the inside and outside game coming together to produce results from sleeping and staying on the steps of the Capitol to um, holding the line to get the entire Build Back Better agenda back on track. So I'm proud to, to stand with them. But the tax code, as being one of the few progressives on the Ways and Means Committee, can really uh, determine if we have a rigged society or not. And we often have the Republicans who make decisions um, saying that they're, they're making it on the behalf of working people, but it's often on the behalf of the top 1% of this country and the largest corporations. So the big ba Build Back Better agenda is undoing, undoing the Republican um, tax uh, cuts that they passed in 2017. And I want to say, if you want to see who they value in 2017, who got the permanent tax cuts and who got the temporary tax cuts? The Republicans gave the permanent tax cuts to the wealthiest individuals and the largest corporations in this country, and then gave the tax cuts that were so small that the average worker didn't even notice the difference in their pay. So if, and their tax cuts, the working class, expire by 2025, 2026. So if you want to see who they value, they value the largest corporations while we value working men and women in this country. And that's what we're fighting for is how do we restore that balance? How do we make it better for working people? Because right now we have a society that is getting, you're seeing the disparity of income and wealth grow bigger and bigger. And that makes a a, a democracy that is um, on the rid, uh, on the verge of collapse. You can't have a healthy democracy when that wealth disparity is so large. And that's what we're trying to uh, undo. Additionally, what did the Republicans do when the corporations wanted to have a competitive field on taxes? They didn't give them 28%, which they asked for. They gave them 21%. 
tax rate. So that should tell you everything you need to know about where the Republicans stand. So what this is going to do, we're going to raise all the money necessary to pay for the Build Back Better agenda. We're going to balance out the, the tax code, and we're going to give a true tax cut to working families. And that's going to come in the form of the child tax credit, raises half of the children out of poverty in this country, half. And you saw this at uh, uh, children being uh, brought out of poverty in West Virginia, for example, and in other states. Um, you're also going to see the largest investment in green infrastructure, the green economy and combating climate change in the history of the United States. We're also going to see the low income housing tax credit that will build 1.4 million units of housing and, and focus on the extremely low income individuals, the ones that are ending up struggling to make ends meet. Paid family leave so people can take time off to uh, be with a newborn child or a sick family member. We're also going to have um, child care and a lot of other provisions. This is a big deal, but it's going to be full the taxes on the top income earners in this country and given a tax cut to the lowest income earners. And some of these policies are revolutionary. The advanceable monthly tax credit from the child tax credit can be applied to other programs, but we want to make sure that it stays in place. So we have a lot to do um, in the next. It is only to be transformative when we can make sure that we leave no one behind. Additionally, here's the thing. A lot of people think that we don't care about new bridges and, and transit. Not true, we do. But we know that it, what good is it to have a brand new bridge if you can't even afford to put the, uh, you know, pay the insurance on your car to travel over that bridge or pay for the gas, let alone buy a new electric vehicle, right? What good is it if you have a brand new highway when you are ending up on the streets because you can't make your rent payment or your mortgage payment. We want to make sure that we build back better in a way that builds a, a country and a society and a populace that's for the 21st century. This is a once in a lifetime, a once in a hundred year possibility. This will go down on the same level as the, as the uh, New Deal under FDR the Great Society under, um, under Johnson, and anybody who votes no will be remembered as voting no. And anybody who votes yes will be part of the greatest comeback in the history of this country. With that, Maurice, I yield back. Thank you so much. And I, I couldn't agree with you more. History is upon us. Now, we're getting close to the end here. And to close this out, I want to bring back Representative Jayapal. And also introduce my friend, Leah Greenberg, founder and leader of Indivisible. Indivisible burst onto the scene in the wake of Trump's election, and since then have grown into a powerful force in states across the country and in the nation's capital. Everyone who's ever been involved in the effort to forge and execute an inside-outside strategy over the past few years and months knows the invaluable contribution of Indivisible to the effort. So I'm so very glad to welcome Leah and also welcome back Representative Jayapal to send us out with a call to action. Maurice, thank you. And I wanna thank again, all of our speakers, our two senators, Senator Sanders, Senator Markey, my incredible, incredible colleagues. The Progressive Caucus is so strong because of the leadership of our members. And that tonight you heard from three uh, of my all time favorites. Of course, everyone is my favorite, but Congresswoman Ayanna Presley. Congresswoman Barbara Lee and Congressman Jimmy Gomez, um, just amazing champions for the Build Back Better agenda, but really for the people. And also to Ramon, to Mary Kay, uh, to you, Maurice, and you're going to hear from truly one of the greatest organizers and partners um, for us in the Progressive Caucus, somebody who's been with us as we passed our rules changes, somebody who really understands what inside organizing means through her own experience, Leah Greenberg. And of course, Mary Small, who did so much work to make this happen. Um, also a huge thank you to our interpreters tonight um, and a huge thank you to all of the co-sponsoring organizations. It just feels incredibly uh, powerful to be in community with you all tonight 
And I hope that you're feeling from these powerful speakers tonight, the energy in the movement. But we need your help. We need you to do everything that you can to tell people what is in this Build Back Better Act. We went through the, the different pieces of it today. We need to make sure that people are clear about what's in it and that we're not leaving anyone behind. We need you to tell your stories, like some of the powerful stories we heard today from Mary Kay and from Barbara and others about why these priorities are so transformational and necessary. We need you to make sure that your member of Congress knows that you want us to hold the line and to make sure that we pass the Build Back Better Act. And of course, that our progressive members that have been holding the line know that you've got our backs as we ensure that both the infrastructure bill and the Build Back Better Act go to the president's desk, not one without the other. So this is the president's agenda, the Democrats' agenda, the people's agenda. Voters gave us the House, the Senate, and the White House because we ran on this Build Back Better agenda. And now we are going to deliver. Let me just end with this. I've always said that being a progressive just means being first to the best and most just idea. And if politics is the art of the possible, then it is our job as activists and organizers, whether we sit on the outside, whether we sit in Congress, wherever we sit, to push the boundaries of what is seen as possible. Because the possible is not static. The possible is created. We create it. Our movement creates it. And so in this fight for the Build Back Better agenda, we are doing that right now. And we're on the precipice of the most significant investment in working people since the New Deal. And I know that I speak for our progressive caucus in the House and our progressive allies in the Senate when I say that we are more committed than ever to getting this done. So thank you so much, Maurice, and I'll turn it back to you. Thank you for your amazing leadership um, and for just always being right there on the front lines of organizing for change. Thank you, thank you so much. And I can't, uh... I think you summed it up right there, like we create the possible. And with that, I want to introduce my friend, Leah Greenberg, founder and leader of Indivisible. Leah, take us home. Thank you, Maurice. Um, And thanks again to all of tonight's speakers, uh, both inside and outside of Congress. Um, I'm so inspired to be here with you as you are articulating just how important it is um, to stay united in this final stretch of passing this truly transformational, full, inclusive recovery package that is going to be the Build Back Better Act. Now, progressive members of Congress have done an incredible job so far in the fight for a robust reconciliation package that really delivers for all people, especially working families of color. How? Let's review. Um, They identified key policy priorities at the very beginning of this process, and they strategically negotiated on all of them, and they simultaneously built up a voting block through the Congressional Progressive Caucus to ensure that this inadequate bipartisan infrastructure package does not move until we see a bigger and more inclusive recovery. Now, just a couple of weeks ago, when a handful of conservative Democrats were attempting to force a vote on this bipartisan infrastructure package, there was enormous pressure that the Congressional Progressive Caucus was facing to break ranks and to let it move forward. But very importantly, they were not alone in this fight. Allies in the Senate made it clear that they had the CPC's back. They were demanding in demanding that the full Build Back Better package agenda pass before this inadequate infrastructure deal. That type of unity uh, the one, the kind that we saw a couple weeks ago, the kind that we see on display in this call tonight, that is how we are going to win transformational change. Now, grassroots groups um, like ours, like the folks who joined on this call, we have continued to ramp up energy, to hold out ambition, to build support for the voting block strategy. We are mobilizing activists across the country to hold accountable the corporate-backed Democrats who are trying to weaken it, who are doing the bidding of their big corporate donors, If you have been on this call, uh, have been part of reaching out uh, to one of those corporate Democrats or thanking your progressive member, thank you. Um, That is your work that is making this possible. Now, it's thanks to progressives fighting for popular programs like universal child care, paid leave, a pathway to citizenship, investments in affordable housing, lowering prescription drug prices, expanding Medicare, taxing the rich, 
investing in programs that save our planet from climate change, it's thanks to progressives that Democrats still have an opportunity to deliver on their promises for this year. And I wanna just underscore that point. If it was not for the steadfast way that progressives have held together, conservative Democratic lawmakers would have passed an inadequate bill and they would have left millions behind. Now, perhaps most importantly, progressives on the inside and the outside have held impressive cross-issue solidarity in their advocacy. We've supported each other's priorities. We have avoided the zero-sum tactics that try to crowd out some provisions in favor of others. Progressive Caucus and our progressive champions have repeatedly said they're not going to negotiate against themselves. Corporate-backed Democrats have to actually come to the table and make their offer. They have to tell their constituents what programs, what crucial popular programs that are on, or they believe should be on the chopping block. We're not negotiating with ourselves. They need to actually defend their choices. Now, once again, I want to thank all the speakers on tonight's town hall, um, especially, or, well, I want to thank all the speakers on this, uh, tonight's town hall. You've inspired, you've made us believe uh, that this is all possible, that we are winning. I want to leave you with this statement. This is a winnable fight. What it's going to take is strong alignment, sharp interventions, and bold negotiations to get our progressive priorities across the finish line. Now, every single one of you watching, again, is critical in this fight. It's because of you that we are so close and we need you to keep it up now. Uh, we need you to call your senators and representatives. We need you to ensure that they are going to support our key priorities in the Build Back Better Act. And we need to fight to pass an inclusive recovery right now. Tell your member of Congress that it is time to deliver for all the people.